Most research into complexity doesn't address directly the fundamental issue that the complexity of any particular matter or thing has a significant subjective component in which the degree of complexity depends on your frame of reference. Yet we can show readily that the perceived complexity of an entity under consideration can vary dramatically if different perspectives are taken. This presentation illustrates that it's relatively easy in any context to state that context in such a manner as to cause confusion by establishing a perspective that incorporates all dimensions simultaneously in a two-dimensional view. However, it's equally possible, in many cases and certainly in design, by choosing an appropriate view that reduces the complexity. We also show the utility of such an approach when designing systems of systems, in which the establishment of the perspective of a system centricity is essential for the specification and acquisition of the constituent systems of a system of systems. Before we start, we need to cover some basic graph theory. A graph comprises a set of objects, called vertices, connected by links, called edges. The links between vertices may be undirected, and the graph is called symmetric, when the relationship is in either direction, or directed, the graph is called asymmetric, when the relationship is one direction only. The graph at the top of this slide is symmetric, the graph at the bottom is asymmetric, it's a directed graph. When there is only one edge for each pair of vertices, the graph is called a minimally connected graph. Minimally connected means that the removal of one edge will result in two subgraphs. The graph on the left is minimally connected, so too is the graph on the right, and you can see that one such minimally connected graph we can call a tree. Note that the tree structure invokes the notion of a hierarchy. That is, the vertices in the graph belong to various levels, and we show four levels here. When a hierarchy is constructed as it is here, it's called a nested hierarchy, in which there may be multiple vertices at each level, but each of the vertices can only have one parent at each level. The branches always diverge and never converge again. This nested structure is also called a compositional hierarchy because each of the levels of the hierarchy can be considered to be composed of the vertices connected to it at the next level. Perhaps that's a bit more obvious if we take a slightly different view. If we take a planned view of a nested hierarchy, it appears as a Venn diagram. So here in this diagram we're showing you the tree structure at the top, the hierarchical view, and the same view, the plan view, the Venn diagram view, at the bottom. And you can see then why it's called a nested hierarchy, in that each element is a subset of the parent set at each of the levels. Now this figure shows a perfectly nested hierarchy, in which each element of the tree has only one parent, which has only one parent, which has only one parent, and so on, all the way up to the highest level of the hierarchy, which is called the hierarch, or, in the case of a directed tree, is called the root. The structure is also called a cladistic taxonomy. Clade is the Greek word for a tree branch. And so we can refer then to this hierarchical structure, which is common in many system compositions or decompositions, as a hierarch, a directed tree, or a cladistic taxonomy, or a perfectly nested hierarchy. So with those basics behind us, let's look at a simple example of how perception can reduce complexity. Here is what seems to be a highly connected graph. This perspective belies, however, that I've collapsed a three-dimensional view into two dimensions. Let me label each of the vertices and redraw it from a three-dimensional perspective. So these two views are now identical. The one on the left was the view we had previously, but with the vertices numbered, and the one on the right is it with restructured to show it then in its three-dimensional form. The one on the right, clearly, is much more useful to us as humans. To extend that notion further, here's what is seemingly an even more complex graph, yet, redrawn with perspective in the third dimension, we can see a much simpler view. In fact, if we take that one step further, from that perspective we can see that we're actually really looking at two, perhaps identical, cubes with an interface between two specified vertices. And so again, the observation here is that we can, if we want, in any context, make that context as confused as possible, or we can take a perspective which allows us to be able to reduce that complexity to a point which is manageable for the purposes for which we're actually viewing the objects. Now, the reason we're interested in graphs is that they're good ways to illustrate systems. That's because, a system comprises internal system elements that are interconnected. 
we can therefore model a system as a graph with the system elements as the vertices and their interfaces as the links. When the system of interest consists of system elements that are systems in their own right, it's called a system of systems. Now, a system of systems has a similar architecture to that of a system, in that both comprise elements that are interconnected. So if the system of systems and a system both comprise elements that are interconnected, how then are they different? Why do we give them two different names? Well, in the system, the subsystems are not independent. They only exist to serve the parent system, and they're invariably suboptimal, from their perspective at least, since it's the system that's to be optimised, not the constituent subsystems. On the other hand, the system of system elements are systems in their own right, so they are managerially independent and operationally independent, and they have been optimised for their own purposes before contributing to the purpose of the system of systems. They'll also, no doubt, have an independent life cycle, and they'll probably be procured independently. So these two diagrams show the difference between a system of elements and a system of systems comprising a systems as elements. A system on the left is an integration of codependent subsystems permanently interconnected to achieve the purpose of the system. On the other hand, on the right, a system of systems is an integration of a number of independent systems that are interconnected for a period of time to achieve a common purpose, a purpose of the system of systems. And so system comprises subsystems that are permanently integrated, tightly integrated, we say, tightly coupled. A system of systems is a loosely coupled collection of systems that come together for a short period of time. Subsystems are not independent, systems are independent. So a system of systems comprises a set of independent systems integrated to achieve a common purpose for a period of time. So if a system of elements is not the same as a system of systems, what's the principal difference? Well, as we saw in the previous slide, a system is an integration of a number of codependent subsystems interconnected permanently. A system of systems is an integrated set of a number of independent systems interconnected temporarily. And so a system of systems is not designed the same way as we would design a system of elements, because in each case, the collection of those elements is going to be different. In a system, the collection stays static for all time. In a system of systems, the systems will change with time, and the resulting combination will be a different system of systems. So, with a basic introduction to graph theory, a little bit of discussion about system of systems, let's put all that together. Earlier, we called this structure a tree, a directed graph. It's a perfectly nested hierarchy, it's a cladistic taxonomy. Now, if it weren't, and there was some cross-linking between nodes, the structure becomes one of a semi-lattice. In the literature, we can find a number of examples, and I've just chosen one here, of a complex semi-lattice which is used to describe the functional relationships between six people, Al, Bob, Chris, Dave, Ed and Fred. And for convenience, we'll use their first letters to, to show the graphs in the subsequent slides. Their relationships are as follows. Chris and Dave play chess. Dave and Ed play tennis on the weekends. Al, Bob and Chris ski together during winter. Bob, Chris and Dave jog every morning during summer. Al, Bob, Chris, Dave and Ed sing in a choir during the Christmas season. And all six belong to the same country club. The example then shows a semi-lattice, where there are cross-links between nodes at different layers. It's no longer a directed graph. The connectedness of that semi-lattice, you can see then, increases the complexity of the relationships between the six individuals. We can also consider our friends as a simple example of a number of systems, albeit six individuals in this case. Those six systems, those six individuals, come together to form a number of systems of systems, which are effectively six activities in this case. So we can have a skiing system of systems, a chess system of systems, a tennis system of systems, a singing system of systems, a jogging system of systems, and a country club system of systems. So the example then also helps us because it serves as a simple illustration of the perceived complexity of a system of systems when a number of systems can be combined in a number of ways to produce that system of systems or a number of system of systems. Now the complexity of interrelationships is even more obvious when we look at the Venn diagram. Clearly, from the diagram on the right, 
we're not looking at a clavistic structure anymore. There's no longer a directed graph or a perfectly nested hierarchy. Now these diagrams are correct. They do accommodate all of the problem elements and they do reflect the complexity of the relevant relationships among individuals. It's not, however, a very elegant start point for the design because it's much more complex than is necessary since it conflates a number of things. It conflates winter and summer to occur at the same time and it also assumes that individuals can participate in all group activities at all times. In reality, both of these assumptions are not true. The activities are seasonal, and even then, an individual can only undertake one activity at a time. If we adopt a perspective that takes into account the real-world constraints, the artificial complexity begins to fade. Imagine, for example, that our friends live in the Northern Hemisphere, and it's summer in which case there is no skiing and no Christmas carols. It's a nice day, so Dave decides to play tennis with Ed, which means he can't play chess with Chris, which means Chris can only go for a jog with Bob, since skiing is not available. Al is left with no other option except to go to the club with Fred. The end result is a simple cladistic taxonomy, as shown here. Let's look at another case. Let's imagine it's now Christmas, and the five carolers... Al, Bob, Chris, Dave and Ed decide to practice. Friendless, Fred is left to head to the club by himself. Now again, accounting for the real world constraints invariably results in a perfectly nested structure. Again, the individuals, or the systems, can be shown as a directed graph where each can belong to only one group or one system of systems at any one time. Now we could keep on going, and if we do, then we'll find that every time we look at a group activity, it results in a cladistic taxonomy. These two examples are sufficient to simply illustrate the point that complexity can be reduced when an appropriate viewpoint is established. In other words, it's relatively easy in any context to state that context in such a way as to cause confusion by establishing a perspective that incorporates everything simultaneously in one, one dimensional view, regardless of whether or not those dimensions are orthogonal. It's equally possible, by choosing an appropriate view with orthogonal dimensions, to reduce the complexity for the purposes for which the assumptions are made. This is, of course, always possible when there are humans involved, because an individual human can normally only do one thing at a time. In our example above, Dave is able to choose to play chess, go for a jog, sing in the choir, or go to the club. But, for all intents and purposes at least, he can only do one of those things at a time. So just as endeavours involving humans are invariably cladistic because a human can only perform one activity at a time, a system, although it may be able to exist in many states in many modes, can generally only exist in one state of one mode at any one time. Consequently, the complexity of relationships can be dramatically reduced by recognising that in this case, an individual can only engage in one group activity at one time. The use of perspective begins as soon as the operational scenarios are described. An inappropriate perspective leads to complex relationships that are represented by overly complex operational scenarios. Remember our simple example, the original description. You can see straight away that from that description, whilst it's correct, it's not a helpful view because it conflates all possible things at all possible times into one description. If we were to write these operational scenarios as the start point for system design, we need to transform the descriptions to be centred on the individuals, that is, centred on the systems, not the system of systems, and noting the appropriate constraints. So, for example, if we look at Al, we say that Al must be able to ski with Bob and Chris, but only during winter, must be able to sing in a Christmas choir with Bob, Chris, Dave and Ed, but only during winter must be able to go to the club, but at any time. Bob must be able to, ski with Alan, Chris, etc, etc. Chris must be able to, and so on. And so the system of systems perspective is important in that the top-down view is necessary for any design. However, if we start our operational scenarios as a collective set of systems of systems as a group of activities at any time, then we end up with complexity. Ultimately, all system design must be system-centric. That is, there is a system specification, a system prime contractor, a system contract, a system statement of work that must describe what that contractor has to do. 
and by definition, the system, when it's finished, is managerially and operationally independent. There must therefore be a system view, even though it needs to belong to a system of systems or a number of system of systems, all design of the system must be system-centric. So even though the system may well exist as part of a number of system of systems, any issues associated with joining each of those systems of systems must be articulated and addressed as interfaces that can be specified for the system as it is developed. So for example, let's look at Al, who must be able to ski with Bob and Chris during winter, sing in a Christmas choir with Bob, Chris, Dave and Ed in winter, and go to the club with all of them at any time. Now here we can see that we can take the two perspectives. The original perspective on the left is that Al is a member of a convoluted hierarchy of systems of systems. Or if we take the perspective on the right of Al as an individual system who must be able to join several systems of systems and further join only one of those system systems at any one time, we get a much clearer view. If we take that latter perspective, we can see more clearly what needs to be done to deliver the capability of system L, given that it needs to interface with others to create a number of systems of systems, the group activities we're talking about in this case. In the same manner that our six individuals cannot undertake any more than one activity at a time, or be in any more than one place at a time, a system cannot join more than one system of systems at a time. Further, when it does, the critical issue is what needs to be done to ensure adequate interfaces to allow the system to interoperate with the other systems in any given system of systems. So this system-centric view allows a much clearer view of how each system is required to interoperate with other systems to form a number of system of systems. And so here we have in this diagram system L at the centre showing the relationships it must have with other systems to form systems of systems. So let's just focus on the interface between Al and Bob. We'll call it the AB interface. And we can see that the relationship between Al and Bob is threefold. Al and Bob must have a relationship to go skiing. They must have a relationship to go clubbing. And they must have a relationship to go singing. More usefully, if we show this alternative view of the three interfaces from a system-centric perspective, we can see that system A and system B are required to interoperate to join three different systems of systems, a clubbing system of systems, a skiing system of systems, and a singing system of systems. When they do that, A is in the clubbing mode, B are in the clubbing mode, and they have an AB clubbing interface as part of the clubbing system of systems. When they join the skiing, then A has a skiing mode, B has a skiing mode, and they join with an AB skiing interface to form an AB system of systems noting that I also need to include the other systems as part of that diagram. Here, just simply focusing on the relationship between A and B. Note that the different modes mean that each of the systems must be able to perform that mode, but they can't perform the same mode at the same time. For example, Al's singing mode is different from his skiing mode. Well, he may well be yodeling down the slope, but that's not the same thing. Note that also the interfaces between the systems are explicitly named. For example, there is the AB clubbing interface, the AB skiing interface, and the AB singing interface. If the individuals are to, as with systems, be managerially and operationally independent, then the system of systems must be well-defined and must be system-centric if systems are to join systems of systems. As illustrated here, the interfaces for any system of systems must be defined such that the interfaces between systems in the system of systems are defined. The external interfaces for system A, such as environmental, regulatory and power and so on, are defined in the system A concept, along with the needs for system A. The system of systems interfaces, to which system A must conform, must be then described in the respective system of systems concepts. So we have a clubbing system of systems concept, a skiing system of systems concept, and so on. So systems then, whilst they are designed to be system-centric, must be designed in the context of a system context and also the system of systems context to which that system is required to join. So this is a simple example to be able to show that it's relatively easy in any context to state that context in a manner which can then cause confusion by choosing an inappropriate perspective. 
and that inappropriateness normally comes by having operational scenarios that incorporate all dimensions simultaneously in a single dimensional view. However, it's equally possible in many cases, and certainly in design, to reduce the complexity by choosing appropriate views with orthogonal dimensions, which means we must be very careful when we write the operational scenarios to choose those operational scenarios such that they are system-centric. So that's particularly true when designing system of systems, in which whilst we do need the system of systems concepts, we need to be able to transform those into system-centric descriptions if the system is to be specified and acquired appropriately. So in conclusion, we need two different perspectives when designing system of systems. We need the system of systems perspective because it talks about how those systems are going to combine to be able to achieve the purpose of the system of systems. We need to state what the system of systems expects of each of the constituent systems to be able to achieve that purpose. But we need to transform then from that description into a system-centric perspective which describes what the system itself does, what interfaces are required for that system, A, to exist within its environment, and B, to exist within the system of systems, or rather, all the system of systems to which it's meant to be a constituent element. However, ultimately, all system design must, ipso facto, be system-centric, since the system is, by definition, managerially and operationally independent. Consequently, System of systems issues must be articulated and addressed as interfaces that can be specified for each system. If you are interested in this and similar topics, you may also be interested in the Capability Systems Centre at UNSW Canberra. The centre is an independent think tank that offers cutting-edge research and analysis to government, defence and industry. For more information, please visit our website. You may also be interested in these two texts, System Engineering Practice and Requirements Practice. Both are available in paperback form from the Amazon website or from the publisher, Argos Press.